video will present population-based training of neural networks. This is an AutoML hyperparameter optimization technique developed by Google's DeepMind Lab. This technique has recently resurfaced in popularity thanks to success in data augmentation and a collaboration between Google DeepMind and Waymo self-driving cars. In addition to population-based training, we're going to present an application of it in data augmentation. In this paper, Population-Based Augmentation, Efficient Learning of Augmentation Policy Schedules. So the headline idea of population-based training is that it's a hyperparameter optimization technique similar to genetic algorithms that learns a schedule of hyperparameters rather than fixed values. And we'll talk more in the presentation about what is a schedule of hyperparameters and the comparison to fixed values. Another headline idea is that population-based training jointly optimizes the parameters and hyperparameters compared to techniques that search for hyperparameters restarting the model at each uh, like hyperparameter evaluation. Another headline idea is that when population-based training is applied to data augmentation in the other paper, it rivals the performance of auto-augment, which uses uh, 1.8 million epochs, whereas population-based augmentation only uses 3.2 thousand. So it's much, if it, using this for your own data set, unless you're a massive company, this is a much more practical algorithm for optimizing uh, hyperparameters. So let's start with what is a schedule of hyperparameters. This is extremely common with learning rate, used almost ubiquitously in every application. You would start with some learning rate value and then decrease it by a fixed factor, or you'd use some kind of uh, like learning rate cycling or you know some kind of annealing technique. So you can think of scheduling learning rate, scheduling dropout, and then data augmentation magnitudes of uh, different op uh, augmentations. And then not explored yet, but maybe architecture cell connections could also have a fixed connection which would be a really interesting area of future research in this. So here's what's meant by a schedule of hyperparameters. You're trying to find the best set of uh, parameters, theta, and you do it by evaluating it on some task. So you improve theta by iteratively stepping it with gradient descent given these hyperparameters. So usually you continually optimize the parameters given the hyperparameters with uh, the same exact hyperparameters. H1 would be H2 would be HT. But in this, uh, in this algorithm, we're going to step with H1, say, and then uh, change the hyperparameters. So say H10 would be a different uh, hyperparameter set for the gradient step that updates the parameters. So previous approaches to uh, hyperparameter optimization generally fall into parallel and sequential optimizations. So parallel optimization, something like random or grid search, where you uh, configure some kind of search space and then you just send a bunch of models to go and train themselves to either convergence or uh, you know some early stopping criterion or some kind of like predictive technique that will say, okay, if this is where we're at at 20 epochs, we predict to be here after 100 or something like that. And then sequential optimization is things like Bayesian optimization or like what you might do when you uh, kind of sit in front of your computer, train your model, and then say, okay, I think I'm going to uh, increase the dropout rate and then observe what happens there and then say, okay, well, I think the problem is somewhere else. Sequential optimization will generally outperform uh, like parallel, like randomly throwing different things. But again, it's not optimal because you have to wait for the runs to converge to do the next uh, round of evaluations. So population-based training is a really interesting idea. And in this uh, section, we're going to explain the algorithm. So what you do is you have a population of models that each have their initial weights and initial parameters sampled uh, from some uh, hyperparameter distribution. So these models are trained uh, until some criterion is reached, and then there is uh, a mechanism for exploring and exploiting. So the exploiting technique is, so the model is evaluated, and then it looks at the population and it says, okay, I'd rather it be this model. So it'll take that model's weights and hyperparameters, and then it will modify the hyperparameters in some way, and then train. So this is the algorithm. The, uh, the models are trained, and then they, you know, they step, and then they're evaluated. So then uh, they'll exploit based on you know, how they rank in the population. They'll go and find another model with uh, another set of weights and hyperparameters that they would rather be. And then they will explore. So they will modify the hyperparameters in some way such that the algorithm is searching for new hyperparameters. So how is explore and exploit managed in the algorithm? So exploit. Exploiting is when the, when the model is saying, uh, or like an individual in the population is going, I'd rather be uh, a better performing model. So this can either happen through truncation selection or binary tournament uh, or t-test selection. So in truncation selection, all the agents in the population are ranked, 
And if the agent is in the bottom 20% of the population, it'll sample another agent uh, from the top 20% uniformly and then copy its weights and hyperparameters. In binary tournament, uh, it's going to grab another member of the population and then just go head to head with it. And if the other, mem uh, the other one is better, it will just uh, copy that one. So explore is done through perturb perturbing the hyperparameter values and then resampling the hyperparameters from the initial prior distribution. So perturbing would mean that it would, uh, like let's say it copies a hyperparameter on data augmentation where the uh, it's like uh, translate 20 pixels. It would uh, maybe set it to 15 pixels or 25 pixels. Whereas resampling would mean it would go back to the distribution of uh, translate magnitudes and you know sample, let's say, 35, something outrageously different. So this is how they uh, describe each of the tests they do with this, uh, the hyperparameters they're searching, how many workers they use, uh, what is a step, uh, how do you evaluate, when is it ready to go into the exploit-explore phase, and then which explore-exploit algorithms are used. So these are the parameters that they use for GANs. So they're going to optimize the hyperparameters are the learning rates on the discriminator and the generator separately. These are two separate hyperparameters, not the same learning rate for both models. So these are the values that they use for GANs. The hyperparameters are the discriminator and generator learning rates. These are separate values. It's not the same learning rate for each of the two models in the GAN framework. They're going to use 45 workers running uh, in the population. They're going to use five gradient descent updates on the discriminator, followed by a single update of the generator. And this is done because they use the uh, Wasserstein GAN gradient penalty such that uh, this kind of thing is uh, like a favorable thing to do. And then they're going to evaluate the inception score on the CIFAR 10 data set rather than the ImageNet data set directly such that they're not overfitting on the eventual evaluation. So they're going to exploit explore after every uh, five times 10 to the three steps. So the exploiting, they're going to use the truncation selection and then exploring, they're going to perturb with the learning rates of each of these models with aggressive factors. So population-based training is decentralized and asynchronous. Each training can run asynchronously and evaluate its performance periodically. And there doesn't need to be a centralized uh, like master-slave architecture where the they are all evaluated and they're all sent to run again in this way. All that needs to happen is that there is a globally available uh, dictionary of each of the uh, current performance weights and hyperparameters. So these are the results that they find across reinforcement learning tasks and then neural machine translation with the transformer model and then the GAN as just described. You see a, a pretty sizable improvement in uh, every case explored. So these are the learning curves from the models you see a pretty substantial improvement uh, and just generally you, you can just see how it compares with the baseline techniques. Even in this Atari Miss Pac-Man game, it hasn't really like saturated like with a curve like this yet. And another really interesting thing about evolutionary algorithms and population-based training is that you end up with these phylogenetic trees. So what these are is they all start from some root node and then as they branch off and evolve, you get to kind of see like how they diverged and how they ended up converging into one area. So like this shows like many models ended up coming to like share this root node, which is really interesting. And, and it's also interesting to see like really disjoint ones. This might be like resampling or something like that. So now we're going to turn our focus to the application of this algorithm, population-based population -based training, into data augmentation and the learning of augmentation policy schedules. So data augmentation is, a is like a regularization technique in computer vision models. You see this uh, original image, and this is it translating uh, like the y-axis, see how it's shifted down and replaced by these gray pixels. And this is a more extreme data augmentation where the, uh, like the colors are completely distorted. So auto-augment is a technique that uses a reinforcement learning controller trained with, it's a recurrent neural network trained with proximal policy optimization that learns the magnitude of operation and probability of applying, applying the operation for several different augmentation functions. So these are the augmentation functions. See, this is a color, I mean, uh, shear the y-axis, translate the y-axis, like a color modification. These are, there are 16 of these different functions used in auto-augment to produce ways of regularizing the images as a pre-processing before they hit the neural network. So this is the comparison of search algorithms. Auto-augment is really computationally exhaustive. It's trained with proximal policy optimization over 15,000 child models, and they, so they sample the policy, evaluate it in this way, where there's the RNN this train, and then there's the child networks that are trained. The population-based augmentation obviously is going to be trained in the way that we've just described. So the computational comparison is that auto augment takes 1.8 million epochs, whereas uh, PBA only takes 3.2 thousand. 
So this is the example I showed before. This is the policy that uh, PBI fi PBA finds on the uh, CIFAR 10 car image. So you see at Epoch 20, it's a pretty aggressive uh, translation, 80 and then 140 and then 200, because remember, population-based training learns a schedule rather than a fixed policy. So it's they take they uh, like take this apart and they this is like the final policy, right? So they take that apart and they use just that policy to train the network throughout and then compare it to the schedule learned and they find that the schedule uh, performs much better. Additionally, they test uh, randomly shuffling the schedule. So say this schedule came here and this one came at the end. That wouldn't perform well as the schedule that's learned during training. So this is the PBA algorithm that they use. They are going to, these are like the uh, prior distribution of the uh, magnitude and probability and operation parameters. And then, so more interesting is their explore algorithm. They're going to use a combination of perturbing it and resampling it. So they're, you know, randomly, if this value is this, then they will resample. Otherwise, they'll perturb it. So you see less than 0 0.2. More frequently than not, they're going to resample it than, uh, I mean, uh, perturb it rather than resample it. So this is another description of like the population-based training algorithm. So each step is one epoch of gradient descent. They're going to evaluate them after three epochs. Uh, they're going to use the validation set that's disjoint from the test set to evaluate uh, the models at each step. They're going to exploit with the truncation selection where the bottom 25% uniformly clones themselves with the top 25%. And then explore is what we just saw this combination of perturbation and resampling. So these are the results from the population-based augmentation. You see that it rivals the auto augment even with way less uh, compute. And this is compared against baseline augmentations and another popular data augmentation technique, which is cutout, where you randomly like crop out, crop out a part of the image similar to like drop out in the input space. So you see across many different data sets like uh, reduced CIFAR 10, which is uh, 4,000 images from the 50,000 of the CIFAR 10 data set, CIFAR 100 and the street view house numbers data set, the population based augmentation, which is much, much faster to run, performs similar to, similarly to auto augment and outperforms cut out in the baseline augmentation strategies. Thanks for watching this video on population based training from DeepMind and seeing the application developed by UC Berkeley for applying population-based training to data augmentation policies. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning videos. Thank you for watching.